with this, and I just wanted to kind of... Two weeks ago, I ended with this, and I wanted to just briefly come back to it and look at it in more detail. Um, it was supposed to be a question at the time, but, you know, then it didn't really work out like that. So I just want to go through this real, just kind of simply, and if you have any questions, you know. Um, when, we're, when we're disciplining, it's important that we discipline with purpose. And that goes for, as parents, that goes for in, in church, and, and it goes for in the work situation. Um, obviously, you know, there, there are some people who are in a place of being able to bring discipline. Like, for instance, it's not the place of, you know... Uh, a worship team member, for instance, to discipline the pastor. See what I mean? Like, it just doesn't work like that. Um, it's also not your place as the em uh, employee to discipline the employer. See what I mean? Like that? It doesn't work like that. Uh, then the same as the kid wouldn't discipline the parent. Um, so, you know, there's obviously that, that there needs to be a balance with it. But also, the, the discipline needs to be done with purpose. And some of the main reasons, now, not the only reasons, but some of the main reasons for discipline are first off to correct foolish behavior. Okay? Oftentimes we discipline because of annoyance or because of you know stuff like that, and and we really don't have a lot of basis for some of the times that we um, we discipline. So first off, correct for foolish behavior. Um, if if the child or person is doing something that's going to cause them harm or or it's just you know something like that, like. Well, I mean, that kind of explains itself. Another example is uh, to give a sense of morality. You know, like, for instance, um, lying isn't necessarily foolish, you know, but however, it's immoral, which is foolish. See what I mean? So it kind of, I guess, walks a tight line, I guess. Um, to correct reckless activity, um, to stop rebellion. Uh, rebellion is, is, is a very natural thing for people to do. Um, I, it's like it's like racism, for instance. Racism is bad. Everybody's clear on that, right? However, the attitude behind racism is not going away. It's just changing. Okay, the same attitude behind racism is the same attitude behind sexism. It is the same attitude behind what is that attitude? It's the attitude of feeling like you're superior to someone else, right? So pride really is the root. Of feeling like you're superior, which is the root of feeling like you're racially more advantaged than them, or sexually more advantaged than them. See what I mean? So, um, to stop disrespect, you obviously want to give them an idea of how the real world works. Um, oftentimes, you know, oh, I'm just going to let them make their own decisions. Well, the world doesn't really work like that, though. Uh, you can't just make your own decisions in the real world. Um, if you disrespect people, things happen. For instance... Let's say, for instance, what would happen if you disrespected a judge while you were in court? Mm -hmm. Well, he'd probably rule against you. What would happen if you disrespected a police officer? Well, he'd probably end up getting the ticket. Do you, do you see what I mean? Like, in the real world, you don't just get to pick and choose who to respect. You treat people with respect. In fact, um, there's, a, there's a proverb that goes something like this. I don't remember exactly, but basically, um, a wise person treats a stranger with, with, with respect because they don't know when they're looking in the face of an enemy. See, and it's kind of, kind of that mindset, you know, that you, that you, that you handle things wisely. Um, and so these are just some examples of why you would give discipline. And even then, you don't want to give discipline to an unfair amount. Like, for instance, let's say you're the boss, and you're... Zach's, I hired Zach to clean up trash, and he did it, but he just didn't do the best job. Well, do I want to fire him instantly? No, I want to try and, you know, give him pointers about what I'm looking for, and, you know, give him chances, and that kind of stuff. You wouldn't instantly hop to firing in the same way, if you have kids and you tell your kid to do something, and well, you, I've told them a thousand times to do it. Yes, but you're trying to teach your child how to make decisions. You're trying to teach them how to be a good person. You know what I mean? And so you have to teach with with um, patience. And when you're teaching them, you can't instantly go to spanking. You can't instantly go to you know this ease into it you know what i mean like th there should be layers of, of discipline in the things that we do with with church with family with, with all these different things where discipline has to be done for the, for their best interest and it has to be done with reserve is that going to make sense and if you read in proverbs that's what he's talking about a lot of different times like where he talks about if you spare the, if you spare the rod you hate the child he's not saying you have to beat your kids he's saying you give your children a sense of right and wrong and this is how you show them love you get involved with their development. You show them how to make correct decisions. 
See what I mean? Do you have to spank your kids? No. You can use timeouts or you can use some other method. It doesn't matter what the method is. If you love your kids, you'll discipline them and help them to learn and grow. That's what he's talking about. So, um, also I wanted to make make uh, reference to another thing. I misspoke a couple weeks ago, and it's been bugging me ever since. And if I do not get it on recording, what I meant to say, it's going to bug me forever. Because it's been like two or three weeks, and it's been bothering me like every day. Um, I was talking about capitalism, and I was talking about how with the capitalist government, what you do is you get a job according to the need that is around you. And then I, I said something, and I said basically that it was like socialism, and that's not what I meant to say. What I was saying was with capitalism, you get a job based on the need. And then I said, to get a job that there is no need for and then just expect for people to be able to pay, for, pay you for it, I said, that's socialism. That's not socialism. I totally misspoke. That's called fantasy. <laughs> don't know why I said socialism. I, I don't know where I was going with that, but ever since I said it, even after I said it, I was like, that's the wrong word. I used the wrong word, and I need to think about what word, but then I got distracted, so I wanted to go on record. That misspoke, totally wanted to correct that. So... Back to the main to the main uh, point here. We'll be starting in Proverbs 15, and these are some of the modern day applications of Proverbs. Sorry, these are some of the modern day applications of Proverbs that I wanted to um, to just you know say the, the things that that I've read from Proverbs and I got from Proverbs. Uh, were you okay? Uh, don't shame people or their kids. Just because somebody's doing something wrong doesn't mean you openly shame them. Just because a kid is doing something wrong doesn't mean you openly shame them. I actually just seen something on that on Facebook yesterday. This guy was disciplining his child. The black dude? Uh, somebody else didn't see it was fit for the situation, and she got on him for it, and then she got backlash because she was trying to step in and trying to say oh, that yeah. that's not right, you shouldn't <laughs> do it that way. Well, I saw one that was funny. I thought that's what you were talking about. There's this black dude, and he's all... He all has his kid, and he's like uh, talking to his kid, and he's like, "Man, you disrespected me, so I'm gonna shave your head." And and you know, made it sound like he was gonna discipline his kid openly. On, but then he all stopped and he said, "I'm not gonna do that to my kid." And and it's retarded for you, for you people who are posting these videos online of you openly shaming your kids and then posting it online. You guys need to stop with that. This is this is your child. This isn't this isn't how you raise your kids. And I was just like, "Man, you awesome, man." But anyways. <laughs> So don't shame people or their kids. Don't correct other parents or their kids, especially in public. If someone else is parenting their child, don't. step back. Yeah, don't. Even if they're not parenting in the way that you think that they should, step back. <laughs> the very important things that I've learned from Proverbs. Unless it's physical abuse. Well, yeah. Yes. Unless. Now, I'm, of course, talking about the regular thing. Yeah. However, any time that there is any... Now, as a pastor... If somebody is, tells you about an abusive situation where a child is involved, you actually don't have a choice. You have to report it. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yeah. So if somebody goes to me and tells them about a child abuse situation, I have to report it or I lose my license with the right. sons of God. All right. So there is that. So now that I've said that, um, there are exceptions to the rule. And I've talked about it before in other lessons, so I didn't think about mentioning it again, but I think that maybe I should again. Anytime that there is somebody's life is put in danger, it needs to be escalated to the next step. And there needs to be something something happening. Okay? If a child has unexplained bruises, if a a spouse has unexplained bruises, okay, any times that there is uh, abuse for children or spouses or other people, adults or children, Okay, cutting marks, anything like that, it needs to be dealt with. Okay, you can't just ignore these things, or else somebody could end up dead. Even if it's in a case of 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 where they're abusing themselves, this could still end up with somebody being dead. So, I mean, so you want to make sure that I'm not trying to sidestep that, and that doesn't need to be dealt with. Okay, so, but as a gen like, let's say for what I'm talking about in this in this thing is like. Um, you know, uh, Micah does something wrong, and so I'm talking to him, I give him a spanking. So then somebody steps and says, I don't think you should do it. Well, it's none of your business. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm parenting my child, see what I mean? But with that being said, if you're the parent and somebody does that, you should at least listen to what they have to say. You know what I mean? Handle, ha handle knowledge wisely, and at least be willing to listen to people, even if you don't agree with them right off. Especially after the after you've calmed down, just think about what they said. Like, hey, is there basis for what they said? Am I being too rough? So, anyways, um, 
Don't recommend others in a way without class or in front of others. You don't want to do stuff in classless ways, just like trashy ways. You know what I mean? You, you, you don't you don't want to deal with people like they're objects. You want to deal with them like they're people. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of this. Uh, I had. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it. My favorite professor from college, Dr. Rob Starner. This guy was amazing. This guy was probably the smartest guy I've ever met. Like, oh my gosh. Okay. This guy, when he was going to grad school, when he was becoming a doctor or PhD, whatever, um, he was under this other guy, and one of his classmates was from Africa, a very honor shame culture, and his professor uh, openly shamed his classmate, and so his classmate uh, actually ended up killing himself. Uh, because in his culture, that was to be shamed in public was was worse than death, and so to save face, he would have to kill himself in order to restore honor to his family. Um, anyways, um, you see, what I mean, that's just kind of what I mean. Don't do things in a classless way. If you have something that's actually important to say, to somebody pull them aside and talk to them in person. But don't don't do stuff in classless ways. You know. Anyways, uh, don't get involved with family gossip. Another another example of what Proverbs has to teach us. Stay out of it, guys. Just Stay out of it. What is a gossip? A gossip is anyone who, who whispers secrets, who talks in a negative way about someone else, who um, talks about someone for the purpose of bringing discord, who, when they speak, brings strife. These are these are great examples of gossip. There are there are exceptions. Well, so I just can't talk about anybody. Well, in a way, <laughs> in a way. Uh, if it's actually doing something to build somebody up, like, well, I can't think of an example right now, and that shows you how rare it is that you're actually going to find a time of talking to somebody where it's not going to be gossip. What are you like, going to say? So and so graduated high school. So There's a good example. Yeah. There's a good example. Yeah, okay. Let's do that. Um, and then uh, one more. Uh, when dealing with your kids, talk to them wisely and make good use of the time. Sometimes along the line, we forget that kids are people. Who are developing into adults, and we just kind of forget that, you know. Um, so when you're dealing with with kids, talk to them wisely. You know, are you talking to them? Are you talking down to them? Or are you talking to them in such a way that you want them to accept the knowledge that you're giving them? Do you always have your two cents to add, or is is it something special when you when you when you give your opinion on something? Do you give it when it's asked for, or do you just always barge in? So I mean, make the most of your time. So uh, that takes us to Proverbs 15. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And I found this verse kind of seems like a simple verse at first, but then you start reading and it just got a little bit more complicated. For instance, with your family, with your family situations, a soft answer turns away wrath. What do you do as, as a kid who's living in your parents' house and your parents are real angry with you? A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up trouble. What do you do if your kid, if you're having an argument with your kid? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up. And you see what I mean? It, it fits to so many situations. What do you do at work? What do you do at church? Whoever the antagonist is, are you the person who's lost your temper, or are they the person who's lost your temper? Either way, are you answering with a soft word? See what I mean? This just this this proverb seems like a real simple proverb until you start thinking about all the different situations it applies to. And it's like ah. Well, okay. Uh, verse 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pours out folly. Basically what that means is that um, a wise person uh, does justice to wisdom. When they speak, it encourages people to be wise. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge. It commends the way of wisdom. Uh, the, uh, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father, and by the way, a perverseness in the spirit. I know it's kind of worded a little bit weird, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Perverseness in the spirit breaks the spirit. Does that make sense? When there's something perverse in you, something uh, wayward, something sinful, something evil in you, it breaks your spirit. Does that kind of make sense? I know that, that one kind of, kind of it's weird, worded real weird, but I, after I read it, I was like, I don't think they got that, because... I didn't get it the first time around either, so. Um, verse 5. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. 
In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. Now here's once again another another contrast between spiritual wealth and physical wealth. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure. Because righteous um, uh, righteous people aren't just wealthy with, with things, right? Because things are come and go. Uh, but they're 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 well. They have treasure with wisdom. They have treasure with family. They have treasure with see what I mean things that, that matter. Uh, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. I mean that one kind of explains for itself. We've kind of looked at it in the in past verses. Verse seven: The lips of the wise spread knowledge. Not so the hearts of fools. Verse eight: The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to Him. Now I want you to pay attention to the contrast here. Okay. First off, even good things are not good if your heart is evil. See what he said there? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Is a sacrifice a bad thing? No, it was a good thing. See, but then also notice the contrast between sacrificing something versus prayer. Prayer is something which basically acknowledges, I have nothing to give. A prayer is basically a petition to God. When you pray to God, you're basically admitting, I have nothing to give you. I literally have this request based on nothing. So, I mean, based on you being good, but I have nothing to convince you to answer this prayer. So the contrast there between coming to the Lord with something and him still and him not, not being pleased versus a prayer, which is basically, in the ancient sense, an insult to the gods, right? Because the gods were only interested in what you could offer. So if you didn't have anything to offer, so just a contrast there. Um, and then that also leads us to the idea of Goodness, when you aren't depending on God's righteousness, it doesn't matter. You know, God's looking at the heart. Uh, verse nine: The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but He loves him who pursues righteousness. When I first read this, I was confused. I was, oh, the Lord loves the righteous, so He hates the wicked. Well, pay attention to what He actually said. God hates the way, not the person. Look what He actually said: The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. The way of the wicked. He didn't say God hates people. He said, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. God hates injustice, hates immorality. He hates those things. Uh, he is pleased with righteousness, on the other hand. So the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him and pursues righteousness. Uh, you could contrast the word... Uh, not contrast. Uh, substitute the word um, love for... Um, but he uh, is pleased uh, with the righteous person, or he blesses the righteous person. You see what I mean? It's kind of the idea of um, God... Overtaking them with goodness because of their of their choice to follow him. Verse ten: um, There is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. <coughs> Sheol and Abaddon. Now we're going to do a study on Sheol and Abaddon when we're done, when we're done with uh, Proverbs. Um, but basically, to to keep things simple, uh, Sheol and Abaddon they're basically death or the grave. We'll we'll look at it more in detail later. But for right now, just equate it with the grave. Um, most broadly, it's also going to be defined as the underworld, the afterlife. Um, once again, though, don't get too sidetracked on this. We'll look at this later. Um, so Sheol and, Ab and Abaddon lie uh, open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of men? So the contrast here is those who are dead and and and, and can't do, can't can't change, can't can't uh, look for any hope of the future. Um, God sees all those things. He sees beyond the grave, which we are limited. How much more can he see those things that are in our hearts? Um, how much more are the hearts of the children of man? So it, it's an argument of lesser to greater. De death being the lesser argument. If God can see into the lesser thing, death, how much more can he see into the greater thing, our hearts? Okay. So uh, that takes us to verse 12. A scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. So... There's a few things here um, that I thought was interesting. A scoffer does not, and we'll look at this later, but a scoffer does not like to be reproved. They don't like instruction, right? Boy, have you ever found yourself in that situation? Where somebody says something and he just rubs you the wrong way? Boy, oh boy. Um, he will not go to the wise. That doesn't mean that he won't go to people for for advice. He just won't go to wise people for advice. See what I mean? He'll go to people who he knows won't reprove him. He'll go to people who he knows will comfort him in the thing that he's doing. They'll agree with him. They will agree with him. Why? Because he's a scoffer. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what they do. Uh, verse 13, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. 
the heart, anybody who's had something that weighed on their heart for multiple weeks knows exactly what this verse is, is, is talking about. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feed on folly. Did you hear what he just said? The heart of him who has understanding seeks wisdom, but or seeks knowledge, but it already has understanding because it is currently seeking knowledge. You see what he just said? The heart of him who has understanding, who has understanding, seeks knowledge. Verse 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. Whoops. So that brings us to a few different ideas, inwardly or outwardly. All the days of the afflicted are evil. It doesn't say the evil are afflicted. It says of the afflicted are evil. So someone who's inflicted in their spirit, like depressed or anxious, or someone who's afflicted outwardly, like uh, a slave or something like that, someone who's, who's being physically harmed. Is she okay? The leaf coming. The leaf? <laughs> so, so it takes us to that idea, is it an inward or an outward affliction? And then we get to the next part, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. So we know that with a continual feast, he's not talking about an actual physical feast, right? He's talking about the, the joy, right? The cheerful of heart has a continual feast. It's a joy for them, see? But then in contrast, this other person, all their days are evil. So then we need, we need to figure out, is it an inward or an outward thing? So let's look at the pros and cons of both. If he's talking about all the days of the inwardly afflicted, the depressed, for instance... Then he's just making a comment on how people who are struggling with things in their spirits, how their days are, are evil. It doesn't matter to them. We see this in Genesis when Jacob gets to the end of his life. He says, my days have been short and evil when he had lived over 100 years. Yeah. See what I mean? Um, but if it's an outward affliction, he's more talking about in life when you are afflicted, when, when people are persecuting you and you've been, you know, you've had a rough life, mm -hmm. the days seem evil. But having a cheerful heart will be a continual feast. It'll be something that encourages your spirit. Right. So we're left with two different conclusions. Then, if he's talking about an outward infl affliction, he's saying keep a good heart in it, and it'll be it'll be your sustenance through it. If he's talking about an inward affliction, he's more of just no is saying no to something. If you're dealing with depression, anxiety, all these things that tear away your inner spirit. Your days are going to be evil. It's going to be something that you don't enjoy. It's going to be constant, constant fighting for you. Okay, you see, people, a lot of people commit suicide under these kinds of conditions. So, in which case, but then having a cheerful heart will pull you out of this. Well, anybody who's dealt with things like this knows you can't just decide to have a cheerful heart. No. <laughs> just so, suck it up. Uh, it just suck it up, right? Uh, so we have this contrast. Is he talking about inward or outward? So just keep that in mind. Okay. Any thoughts on that before we move on? Kind of can go either way. Yeah. So, uh, verse uh, 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Now, I need, do need to go back. If he's talking about an inward an inward thing, I will say this. We have talked to great, Lynn, great lengths about things like depression in previous lessons. You can go find those on, on, on YouTube, uh, on, my, on that uh, thing, uh, that YouTube account. Um, if you can't find it, let me know and I will look them up and send them your way. I don't have access to that YouTube right now. I'm still fighting with Google. <laughs> but I will nevertheless be able to find it uh, for you. Uh, and then the next thing uh, is that there comes a point when you're dealing with depression where just because you're dealing with it doesn't mean you have to give in. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it doesn't mean you have to stop fighting. And so I would say that if you are dealing with it, keep fighting it. Don't give in to it. Don't don't do things that are going to enforce that stereotype. Right. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to be happy today anyway. So why even go outside? Don't crush yourself. You know, don't don't give in to these things. Keep fighting it because it will it will cause your days to be very unpleasant. So, 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. And this is kind of because this is kind of a principle that we see more broadly in Proverbs. It talks about you know, a, a, an attractive woman who, who has no discretion being like a pearl, uh, uh, not a pearl, um, jewelry on a pig. You know, it, it talks about when you, when you have a, when you have a, a wife, how it's better, 
so many things to live on the corner of a roof than live with a contentious woman. You see what I mean? Like it's just a general principle throughout Proverbs that it's better. It's not. It doesn't matter how much you have. It's not about quality. It's about quant. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. Sorry, I said that backwards. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. So, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Things won't make you happy. And so we see two different proverbs right back to back that, that kind of go hand in hand. Um, and so then you hear people say, you know, uh, love won't pay the bills. Yeah, that's true. However... True love is a heck of a lot better to live with than, <laughs> you know what I mean? And when I say true love, I'm saying beyond attraction. Yeah. I'm saying true love where you sacrifice of yourself for your partner. You know, that that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, they make my heart so happy. I'm not, not talking about that. I'm talking about actual love, not feelings. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I will say that, you know, life, especially as a married couple, can sometimes be a lot harder than it is being single. That's just a fact of it. However, um, it is better to, to marry someone that, that you put forth the effort to love than to have all these things and, and, and have hatred with it. So, verse 18. And, you know, that's a bigger principle in general. <laughs> another, another way that could apply. Um, when, you become, when you're uh, single and bitter. Not everybody who's single is bitter. But when you are single and bitter, you know, maybe you've gotten a divorce or whatever, and you're just like, men are pigs, or women are pigs, or whatever. And so there you are, and you're eating your dinner alone with hatred. Versus being poor, but being married to somebody that you actually love. See what I mean? So there's just a bigger principle that applies to many different situations. Verse 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Whew. Pay attention to situations in your life. Are you constantly surrounded, surrounded by situations that are just bad situations, maybe you could change that. <laughs> Jesus said it like this, be a peacemaker. Um, verse 19, the way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. Now what does that mean? A mindset. A sluggard finds obstacles. A sluggard finds things that don't exist. The, uh, there's thorns everywhere. I can't get. I, I'm surrounded by versus the person who's actually working. It. There's a highway. I'm, I'm going to work. I, I shared a video on my Facebook. It was this one armed guy or one handed guy. He had part of his other arm, but he was all doing all this ma manual hard labor with his one arm. Stuff that I can't do with both my arms. You know, and that's my point. He didn't find an excuse. He was working. Yeah. Versus some people who are in perfectly good health. I can't work there. It's too hot. And I just don't like the heat. I can't work at McDonald's. That's too low for me. It's like, well, you don't have a job, and maybe you should. So, you know, just a, a, a great... And, you know, I'm not against welfare and those kinds of things, but I do want to say this. Sometimes when you're helping someone who's undeserving of help, you're just teaching them to look for obstacles to getting out there and doing it. Yeah. People, humanity, civilization is based on the idea of making a better world. Right? right? We did things like we invented the light bulb. We invented the telephone. Why? Because people had dreams. They had aspirations. They foresaw something of, of being better than it was. The invention of the car. The invention of the carriage. See, things that, that people envisioned as making the world a better place. When the will was first invented. When fire was discovered. See, these things that, that progressed humanity somewhere. But if a, a man doesn't see the need for, for, for pushing himself, for, for overcoming his obstacles, then he won't. And sometimes welfare does more harm than good. Not all the time, and there are people who need it. But I am saying we need to, be dis we need to have discretion with this. Right. See what I mean? We need to have discretion with this. I've seen people who were, worked and were on welfare that couldn't afford their bills. But then when they got off welfare and didn't switch their job, they were able to pay for their bills. How is that? Because they learned the value of the money they were working for. And because they suddenly got a dream. I can improve my house. 
See what I mean? They they got they got dreams and aspirations. But remember this verse, guys. The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns. I can't find a job. I can't find a good job. My boss hates me. Uh, I can't get to work. Uh, whatever. They find things. It's a hedge of thorns. They they find obstacles. Whereas a diligent person, they they find a way to do it. Yeah. See what I mean? And uh, so, verse twenty. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Notice how it doesn't say makes makes a mother sad. <laughs> Mothers, I think, are have always been known for being the nicer of the two, <laughs> overly forgiving of, of stupid children. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but a foolish man despises his mother, whereas the father is glad from the wise son. The foolish son despises his mother. See a different a different direction there. Um, there is no contrast here between the greater opinion of the father over the mother that is not an apparent con contrast. The only uh, contrast he's obviously making is about the attitudes and the go with it, of, with foolishness and, and, and wisdom. Uh, folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but th basically doing the wrong thing, it, it's joy to the person who lacks sense. But a man of understanding walks straight ahead. Um, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Man, oh man, this is just a, this is just something you guys need to write down. Without counsel, counsel plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. You know, on Sunday night, I'm going to be talking about um, which way you should go, making decisions, and we're going to look at proverbs and whatnot, and and the idea of finding God's will. And I really hope you guys can make it because I think that it's it's this definitely Sunday? this Sunday night. Yes, I think it's definitely a a a message that that people have. No, this Sunday morning. This Sunday morning, that's like the 15th time I've done that. Mm -hmm. It's Sunday morning. Are you teaching Sunday morning? Yes, oh. I am teaching Sunday morning, not Sunday evening. Castro is teaching Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then the next week you're teaching. The next week I'm teaching in the evening, but this Sunday I'm teaching in the morning. Yes. Golly, you'd think I'd remember since I'm the one doing it. Anyways, um, and I think that it's a, it's a very timely, very timely message, not just for our church, but I think for Christianity in, in total. We, we tend to, well... I'll wait for the preaching for Sunday, huh? Um, uh, to make in verse twenty-three, to make an apt answer is a joy to man, but a uh, and a word in season, how good it is! Having a having a, having a word that really helps people. Um, the path of life leads upward for the prudent, that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. Um, basically, the idea here, once again, I don't want to get into Sheol yet, but. There's the idea of longer, more satisfying life back then, and for right now it has the idea of um, an eternal life. Okay, um, that's as simple as I can make it without going into Sheol and what that is and all that. So, uh, verse 25: The Lord tear, tears down the house of the proud, but ma uh, maintains the widow's boundaries. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but gracious words are pure. Verse 27. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates brides will live. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Now, I do want to clarify here. He's not talking about stewing about something, where you're just playing something over and over in your head. He's saying being discerning and wise about how you're going to respond to a situation. Have you ever had somebody do something really stupid and you had the opportunity to really do something stupid back? The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Now, hold on. I probably shouldn't do this. This isn't very smart. Versus, this is what we think of when we think of pondering the answer. Well, if they say this, then I'm going to say this. If they say this, then I'm going to say this. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about like when you're wronged, pondering before you speak. Just hold on for a second and, and being patient. But the mouth of the wicked just pours out evil things. You wrong them, they instantly wrong you back. You say something stupid, they, they, they trump you stupid with more stupid. Yeah. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Another another uh, thing there. Uh, don't have to be perfect, but you can't live uh, your own way. You want to take a picture? Uh, you don't have to be perfect, but you can't live your own way. When he, when he said that, the Lord is far from the wicked. He's not saying if you do anything wrong. He's saying people who are just openly living living wrong. But the mouth, uh, I'm sorry, uh, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. See, people get 
off track with the balance. They try to either live their own life or they try to live as still under the law. You know, they just go to extremes. It's like this, we depend on God, but that just because we're depending on God doesn't mean we have an excuse to sin. So, that takes us to uh, verse 30, I think. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart. The idea, the light of the eyes, what that means is like joy in the eyes. Have you ever seen somebody who's saying something, something good and, and their, their eyes flicker? That's what he's talking about. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart. Basically, when somebody gives you good news, it, it causes you to be glad. Um, and good news refreshes the bones. The ear that listens to life giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Now, this one... Oh, actually, I had a note for that. Light. Twinkle joyous person's eyes. Um, this one I had a note for. The result or the cause. The ear that listens to life giving reproof, it will result with them dwelling with, among the wise, or it will be because they listened to, they were among the wise. See, listen, and it sounds like it could go either way. The ear that, that, that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Well, all things considered, it seems like he's talking about the result. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof, as a result, that person will dwell with the wise. It seems like that's what he's saying. Um, I'm not going to say that there is no basis for the other interpretation. It just doesn't seem likely. Verse 32, whoever ignores instruction despises himself. But he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. This was in a previous chapter. We've already looked at this one. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So um, this one is kind of a little bit of an either-or. The fear of the Lord um, results in uh, instruction and wisdom, or instruction and wisdom results in the fear of the Lord. It, it's, it's kind of ambiguous, because it's what's called, um, if I can remember, I think it's called a finite verb, I think is what it's called. Basically, it's not clarified, and so it could go either way. Either the fear of the Lord results in instruction and wisdom, or instruction and wisdom results in the fear of the Lord. It, it, very ambiguous. So, and humility comes before honor. This is going to be elaborated on in, in chapter 16, uh, when it says pride comes before a fall. So, um, it takes us to chapter 16. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. This is actually one of the verses we're going to be looking at on Sunday. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did you get the one before this one? Okay. So the idea here is that God prevails. No matter what, God remains in control of the situation. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Now, we're going to look at this more on Sunday, so I don't really want to get too much into it. But basically, to summarize it, we get in our hearts all kinds of different things that we want to do. But God will either cause our plans to fail or succeed. See what I mean? So, there's that. Um, verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. I don't think I do that. Well, obviously you don't think you do that, because if you knew you did, you wouldn't do it. <laughs> the, all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. Well, you're going to convince yourself of anything that's right. Right. <laughs> If you want to do anything bad enough, should I marry this person? Oh, it's God's will that I marry this person. Should I go to this? Should I do this? Should I do this? It's God's will. Okay. <laughs> well, there's an idea. Uh, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The word here, um, commit, is actually literally roll. Roll your work to the Lord. Basically, the idea of rolling it to the Lord, uh, shifting your burdens to his burden is basically the idea here. You're rolling it onto the Lord, shifting ownership. Um, so depend on God fully, and he will establish them. So you have humility and prayer plus, uh, humility plus prayer plus his approval equals success. See, what people try to do is they go, I'm going to go my own way and trust God to bring, my, bring, a, bring about what I've planned. I'm just going to make my life's plans, and God's just going to honor that. No, no, no. The idea here is different. It's this. You're trusting in God, and you're, 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 you're seeking in Him for, foremost. And He is going to be establishing your steps. See what I mean? And He also guides you in which way to go. Now, does that mean that, there, that each of our lives has a predestined will that we have to put this for... We were predestined to eat this food. We were predestined to go here today. No. No, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about life plans. Like, a pastor trying to do something to help his church. There's a good example. See I mean, so, um, basically the idea is that, that, that we seek after God and we, we, we try and honor him and he guides our steps and he establishes those things that he wants to be established. 
Um, that does not mean that everything that happens is something that God wanted to happen. Hitler did, and God did not want Hitler to kill the Jews. Okay, people get off topic with this kind of stuff. They go way to dark places. Verse four: um, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Now it sounds in English like he's saying this: that God has made the evil to be destroyed. It sounds like that. Listen, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. That's actually not what he's saying. God hasn't made evil people so they would be destroyed. God is just and ensures justice is basically what he's saying. The Lord has made ev made sure that everything will receive what it is worthy of. It's due purpose. Okay, Even the wicked person will be judged one day. That's basically what he's saying. He's not saying that God created wicked people or that he created wicked people for the sake of destruction. Because A... God doesn't create people for destruction. He desires that everybody be saved, and he doesn't create bad things, right? We make the decision to be bad, right? So, now that we're all clear on that. Verse 5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. This goes right hand in hand with the previous verse. Uh, verse 6, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. Now, here we have a bit of a, of a confusing, confusing verse. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. Who is steadfast love and, 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 and uh, steadfast love and faithfulness? God's or ours? Well, in the text, it seems to implying, be implying our steadfast love, love and faithfulness, which brings a lot of confusion, doesn't it? Especially when you when you read the next parts, because that usually gives gives clarity to what he's talking about. Right. By the fear of the Lord, one uh, turns away from evil. So he's clearly talking about in the second part of the verse our role. So in the first part of the verse, he's probably talking about our role too. Yeah. Just goes to goes to reason. However, that doesn't make sense. It's easy to explain away if we attribute this to Jesus, right? By Jesus' steadfast love and faithfulness, our iniquities atoned for. But it seems to not be what he's talking about. So how do we reconcile this? It seems best to take it like this. When we persevere in seeking after God, God makes it as though we had never done the wrong thing in the first place. And as we seek after God, we turn away from evil. We stop doing the bad thing. And so God makes it as though we had never done it before. See what I mean? We, we, we stop living in sinful life, so God, God changes things for us. See what I mean? Does that mean that we can earn our own salvation? No. But it does mean that since God has saved us, we are responsible for persevering in him so that our iniquity is atoned for. What that means is so that our... So that... It's basically another way of saying this. Somebody who's truly saved will show up by their actions. This is basically another way of saying that. See what I mean? Confusing passage, but don't let it discourage you. Um, verse 7, when a man's way ple ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. One thing I was reading said that this only applied to ancient Israel, that God would d uh, intervene politically. Um, I don't really think that that applies here. It seems best to take it something like this. People will oppose us. As Christians, they opposed Israelites. I mean, read Ezra and Nehemiah, and the people were opposing them for rebuilding the temple and the walls and all that. Okay, So, people are going to oppose us either way, but... When a man's ways please the Lord, he, the person, okay, will act wisely in that situation to turn his enemies into his favor. Rather than saying, you know what, they've established themselves as my enemy, I'm just going to write them off. They can go uh, hop and uh, fly a kite. That's what people say, right, fly a kite? Is that, is that still hip today? Sure. Why not? Sure. Uh, so, so, I mean, instead of having that kind of attitude, the righteous person says... What can I do to bring peace to the situation? He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. He's a peacemaker. Okay. Um, better. Some people attribute this to the second part to God. God makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You could say that, but he's going to do it through us. He's going to expect us. It did give me the ten the ten percent warning check. He's going to expect us to do the right thing. So, um, verse uh, 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. The heart of, of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Not everything that happens is what God wanted. We are not in control 
only God knows the unexpected. God only God knows our length of years and directs us though we still plan. See how that works? We still plan, we still act. Okay? But God gives the direction. He he helps things to fall into place. See what I mean? Now, does that mean every time we're doing God's will that things are just going to work out? No, that's not what it means at all. But it does mean that as we persevere in doing God's will, he will establish those things that he wants established, even if it's not in our lifetime. Does that make sense? What does that mean? That means that ultimately this is, the, this is what this proverb means. Trust in God that he's still in control of the situation. You do what's right. You do what's right. And just trust that God's got it in control. And if it's something that God wants to be established, he'll establish it. That's the point of the proverb. It's not so that we can wonder about God's will and wonder about whether we're... It's not about that at all. It's about realizing that God's still in control. God is still in control. That's the main point. So, verse 10. An oracle is on the lips of a king. His mouth does not sin in, in, uh, in judgment. Now, this one was kind of confusing for me until I realized what he was saying. Basically, what he's saying is, to a king, a king is like God to people. What he, His word is law. See what I mean? God establishes kings, and kings, for all intents and purposes, are like God to the people, because what they say goes. So then, that kind of clarifies what the next part is saying. His mouth does not sin in judgment. A king is justified in carrying out justice, because he's the king. But also, there goes a warning with this, kind of implied in the text, right. that if a king acts immorally, then it's probably bad, right? And then James clarifies this when he says, uh, leaders are judged all the harsher. Um, so then verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 11. A just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. Now this one confused me until I realized that work can also be translated are his concern. Basically the idea here is that God desires, desires um, uh, what's it called, Not for you not to cheat people. And he was the one who, who made the standard of right and wrong. That's basically the idea here. Okay. So verse 12. Um, it is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Verse thirteen: Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he who loves him, and I'm sorry, and he loves him who speaks what is right. The king loves the person who speaks what is right. Um, obviously, a king's going to have a hard time carrying out justice if his people are so immoral that they can't even tell him what actually happened. Uh, a king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. Basically, the king has the authority to kill you if he's mad enough. So, yeah. a wise person would smooth it over. <laughs> in the light of a king's face, there is life. Now, once again, we talked about this before. A light, light is like in the joy. So, in the joy of a king's face. Uh, in the uh, Remember when somebody has light, life in their eyes? Someone has light in their eyes, you know? So, in the light of a king's face, there is life. And his favor is like the clouds that bring the offspring, uh, the spring rain. Because, once again, the king is able to bring about uh, bad things. So if he's joyful, it's like a spring rain. It's a good thing. It's something that you've been looking for. It's something hopeful. Verse 16, how much how much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is to be uh, chosen rather than silver. So basically, even if I end up poor in poverty, it's better to just do the right thing? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, verse 17, the highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. Now, if... You're paying attention to this. Now, I, you probably weren't because I wasn't the first time I read it. If you pay attention to what he actually just said, he basically said this. Look where you're headed and make necessary changes. Are you headed in the right direction? How many times have you heard pastors say that? Mm -hmm. He just said that right here. To, the highway of the upright turns aside from evil. It sees evil and turns aside from it. Whoever guards his way preserves life. Look where you're headed and make necessary changes. Exactly what pastor has said a thousand times. Where you're headed. Uh, ver uh, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. This exactly uh, is the opposite of what 1533 ended on. Humility comes before honor. Pride goes before destruction. See, 1533 contrasts with, contrasts with 1618. Uh, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Um, how many times have you been too stubborn to, to just listen to somebody else and you had to do it your way? And it ended up not going very well. Pride comes before destruction. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to defy the spoil with the proud. Did you hear what he just said? Pride is such a bad and destructive force that it's better to be poor 
It's better to be poor and have nothing to do with a prideful person. Should I go into business with this person? Are they prideful? But they're successful, but are they prideful? That's how Proverbs applies to our lives. See, what we're going to read here in verse 25, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it's end. It goes to destruction. That's a good example of that. This guy's a successful businessman. Yeah, but he's prideful. Now, obviously, there's going to be pride in everybody, but there's a difference between having pride and having an issue with pride. And you know the difference. When you can't be told what to do, when you're always always right, when you always have to get the last word in, when you're the smartest person on the block, everybody else is an idiot, when you know you never ask for anybody's input and advice on plans, you just kind of go for whatever you want, you spit forth whatever's on your... I mean, come on. So anyways... At 20, whoever gives thought to the word will discover good, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Uh, word is another word for command or instruction or teaching. Different translations will say different things. It's basically the same thing. Um, also, it can be read, whoever gives thought to the matter uh, will discover good. So uh, a few lessons you can learn is pay attention to instruction would be the first obvious lesson. But then another instruction was carefully consider and you'll learn. When somebody says something, if you carefully pay attention to what they're saying, you'll learn something. Have you ever had a, had a teacher at the church, uh, maybe a, a preacher who came in and, and they were talking and you just didn't like them at all? Well, you could still learn something. Whoever gives thought to the word will discover good. You can find it if you look for it. Now, blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Verse 21, the wise of heart is called discerning. Um, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Now, these things aren't necessarily good or bad. They're just He's just saying it. The wise of heart is called discerning. Okay. But then the second part is the part that's new. Sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. If you want to persuade somebody, say it, say it well. Ever heard somebody having honeyed lips? <laughs> Anyways, verse 22. Good sense is a fountain of life to him who has it. Good sense. To him who has good sense, it's a fountain of life. Um... But the instruction of fools is folly. Verse 23, uh, The heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to his lips. So in other words, I'm, I'm so smart, I'm just going to uh, say things in, in a rude way. I'm going to say things stupid on Facebook. I'm going to... And adds persuasiveness to his lips. He says things in a good way. Just because you, you see yourself as a wise person doesn't give you free reign to say things in the most stupid way you humanly possibly can. Because I'm the mom, that's why. Okay, well, do you want to be known as a tyrant or do you want to be known as a wise person? Well, I want my kids to respect me. Yeah, and they will respect you in time if you actually speak with wisdom. If you speak with anger, they're probably not going to respect you anyways. Just on that out. See what I mean? Okay, our kids remember the stupid things that we do. In the same way, at work, our bosses remember the stupid things we do. In the same way, at church, our pastors remember the things we've done, the things we've said about them, the things that we've done behind their back. They remember these things. When we hurt people, it hurts people. And they're going to remember it. You can change, but remember that. Words hurt. Our actions hurt. There is not a single action or word that we speak or do that does not leave a ripple effect in the waters of life. Never forget that. Okay? In Gladiator, Maximus says it like this, what we do echoes in eternity. And that's absolutely true. The things that we do do echo in eternity. So, um, verse 24, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Once again, he's just going on and on and on about how wise people say things wisely. I mean, he couldn't say it any clearer. Well, I guess he could. He could say, if you're a smart person, say things in a smart way. But, you know. Verse 25, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Think again is the idea of this proverb. Just because you, you thought, oh, you, I thought it through. Yeah, well, get advice. Think about it some more. Just because it seems right doesn't mean it is. Now, I'm not trying to make you guys so unsure of the way ahead of you that you're afraid to make a decision. But what I am trying to say is, don't make a rash decision. Don't make a rash decision. You know what I mean? It, it, it may seem right at the time, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily right. We'll talk about this more on Sunday, but just remember that. Okay, things aren't always what they seem. You know? So. Um, verse 26, a worker's appetite. Um, hold on a second. Okay. Um, a worker's appetite works for him, but uh, his mouth urges him on. In other words, a diligent person works. Because they're hungry. 
and they continue to work hard because they're hungry. <laughs> Odd thing about need, it's you surprisingly realize what you can go without. That's why you see a lot of times renters who are on welfare who have a satellite dish on the rental. You see that a lot. Why do you see that a lot? Because people who are usually given free money when they could earn it themselves. I'm not talking about people who cannot work. Okay, There are people who need welfare. Okay, I'm not denying that. However, <laughs> there are a lot of people who milk the system. Yeah. I know because my dad is a landlord, or was a landlord, and we see, it seems like we rented all of them. <laughs> anyways. Um, but anyways, uh, so another good part about, about you know working for a living. Um, a worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. Another way of saying this is a dishonest man... Does anybody know what, what an, another word that that person is called in Proverbs? Scoffer. And a whisperer... What's a whisperer? A gossip. Very good. Uh, these kinds of people, they separate close friends. Did you hear that? Da, 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 da. Get out of that situation. That's going to blow up in your face. There is no such thing as a gossip situation ending well. The yeah. yeah, uh, pastor and I, actually, all three of us were talking about people who, who think that it's their responsibility to, to be there for people who have been disgruntled by the pastor. And they just need to give a friendly ear and listen to it. And these people actually do exist. I know it's, it may sound crazy to some people, but they actually do exist. And they actually think that, they're, that, they're, that their ministry is appointed by God. I'm not joking. Really, they do. And they think that their role, their ministry in life is to, is to listen to people who have grievances against the pastors. Genuinely, I'm, I'm not joking. Um, when I first heard this, I was flabbergasted. I didn't know anybody. But then, as the gifts of the Spirit got moving in our church, I realized how it could take root. Sometimes we think that we're just so spiritual, we think that we're just so far above everybody, we think that we're above falling, we're above falling. It's not gossip for me because I have a greater understanding. Just like Solomon did. Just like Solomon did. It's not foolishness for me because I'm wise. I'm the smartest guy in the world here, guys. It's not foolishness for me. See what I mean? We, we fool ourselves into these things. Um, so a whisper separates close friends. Verse 29. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoop. Watch what you say to spouse or friend. Okay, now here's something we do. We say hurtful things about people to our spouse. And eventually our spouse will take up the bad attitude that we have. Did you hear what I just said? Eventually our spouse will take up the bad attitude that we show to our spouse. If you gossip and complain to your spouse about somebody doing something annoying for long enough, eventually your spouse will take your side. Eventually. Or you'll end up divorced. But either way, it's going to end up poorly one way or another. Uh, verse 29, a man of violence uh, entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Have you uh, ever seen uh, Beauty and the Beast, the cartoon? Yes. Where uh, Gaston gets the whole neighborhood to go against the beast, even though the beast had done nothing wrong? Uh, Kill the beast! Yeah. Or if you were at our, uh, uh, our question and answer forum for the uh, men's center... Basically what they did there. Kill Randall! <laughs> Kill the beast! <laughs> Basically the same idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, a man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Now remember, notice that word entice. Persuade somebody to your line of thinking. Whoever winks his eye plans dishonest things. He who purses his lips brings evil to pass. Well, that's great unless you don't know what those things are. So let me just clarify. Winking your eyes is like having shift, shifty eyes. You know, uh, have you ever seen somebody that just has untrustworthy eyes? Another another uh, translation it would be signaling with your eyes, you know, like winking. You know, uh, and then pursing your lips is basically like a clenched jaw, like somebody who gets angry. You know, and they, you know what I mean? They, you know what I mean? That would be the person your lips. Um, he who purses his lips brings evil to pass. Basically, he's overcome with rage and some, nothing good is going to come out of it. And whoever winks his eye plans dishonest things. He's just looking for something, you know, what can I get into? If you've ever worked with the youth uh, at Oasis, for instance, you know exactly what we're talking about here. The shifty eyes, like, how can I steal this PlayStation? How, what can I do here? How can I poke holes in the hose? What can I do here? <laughs> Anyways, anyways. Um, verse 31, I think. Yes. Gray hair is a crown of glory that is gained in a righteous life. Not necessarily, but his point is this. Generally speaking, wise people are going to live longer than fools. Generally speaking. However, 
Not necessarily. I've seen a lot of... Oh, I forgot that I had tea. Now it's cold. Fantastic. Sorry. Uh, a lot of, I've seen a lot of old people that are... Stupid. They're stupid. Mm -hmm. um, whoever is slow to anger is better than... So, just to clarify, just because you have gray hairs on your head doesn't mean you can say, Ha ha, wise! Oh, Nobody's what saying at all. Okay? I, for instance, I've seen some people who... Oh, right. <laughs> I've seen some people who have never had hair. Like, who was it? Um, that one actor, was it uh, Steve Martin, I think? Who's, like, always had white or gray hair? Goodness sakes. Anyways, uh, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty... So I'm not trying to discredit that proverb. I'm just saying, remember, there's a proverb, meaning it's generally true. Somebody who's lived a long life, well, pro chances are that they had the wisdom to live that long, right? Generally speaking, things have changed now. They could be on, on different forms of whatever, you know. Nowadays, you can live McDonald's every day of your life and then just get surgery when you get old, so whatever. Your kidney fails, don't worry about it, I'll give you another one. <laughs> Anyways, uh, well, except for <laughs> if they just decide to quit working one day. <laughs> Verse 32, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Now listen to this one. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty person. And who, he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. I've done great things, but you haven't controlled your temper. No. James taps into this when he talks about the, the, the tongue and how destructive the tongue is. You should read through James over the next week and just see what I'm talking about, the different things he says about the tongue and about pride and these different things. Because the is tongue... Is the tongue that is the root of the evil or the heart? Uh, I don't know if it says that. Um, it says that money is a root of all sorts of evil and it says that the tongue is, is a root of destruction. I don't remember if it says... If it's, you know what? There's a good there's a good thing for you guys to look up. As you're reading through James this week, look to see if it says that the, that the tongue is a root of evil. Look to see if it says that. Because um, I don't remember, and I don't want give to a, give, a, give an answer on something I don't remember. Um, yeah, you guys know I have homework. You can, you can thank your classmate. No, have, you, have you guys ever seen Malcolm in the Middle? You can thank the cadet when I leave. I suggest that they have to look, right? The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Wow, have you noticed that this is a major theme throughout Proverbs 16? The idea that God is in control. So, what does this mean? Well, in, in these days, they used to discern God's will by casting lots. And what I mean by discern God's will is, I mean, should they go to battle, How should that kind of stuff, they would cast lots. For instance, when King Saul was chosen as the king, um, they cast lots to figure out what tribe, then from which tribe, what family, and from what family uh, it was Saul that was chosen by casting the lots. That's how they narrowed it down. So, um... Th that was because they didn't have all this food. Yes. Yes. Well, they... It, they did, in a way, have the Holy Spirit. Let me clarify. The Holy Spirit was that creation. The Holy Spirit empowered certain people for certain things at certain times. Like, for instance, the judges, it says, and then the Spirit of the Lord came on them, and they did this. Right. right. But it wasn't a common occurrence. And the, you couldn't sure. walk with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, then, when the Holy Spirit was given to the church, it was given to all of the church. And all of the church became prophets. Moses uh, prophesied about this when he said, Oh, that all of you would be prophets and prophesy. And then that was fulfilled in the book of Acts. When all of them became prophets and prophesied. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and then also there's the idea of... Uh, but yes, okay, uh, now since you brought that up, casting lots isn't something we do today. To discern God's will, we don't actually, like cast dice or anything, okay? Yeah. We don't... Well, God, if it's your will, I pray that my... Yeah. I flip a coin there. God, if it's your will, that, that the hood of my car would be wet and the ground would be dry. No. No. Once again, God's will isn't... like. Come on Sunday morning if you're curious about God's will, okay? Because <laughs> it's really not that complicated. We've made it complicated. We've made it complicated. It's not that complicated. Man. They didn't cast lots for everything. Whether they should buy a house, whether they should get married. They cast lots for the important things. Should we move the Ark of the Covenant? Should we go to war with these people? Are they going to win? Those kinds of things. Okay, those kinds of things. Okay, they didn't just cast lots for everything. Golly. And it was more about because, once again, Israel was, was, was told to take over the land of Canaan. We aren't told to... 
the lot was was for, to help them discern God's will with proof. And so basically, what he's saying here is that God is guiding the outcome so that they'll know how to how to how to do that. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, basically, God's like guiding the steps. Go ahead. Light, but casting lots is what they did for Jesus' clothes. You know, I'm not sure, because these are Jewish lots, and I don't know if the Jewish lots uh, were the same as Roman lots. Uh, because Rome, Rome, strictly speaking, was, you know, from Italy, so it was, kind of, you know, Latin people. But then, it, it, it's more complicated than that, because as Rome became a, an empire, they also became, it wasn't so much... Your ethnicity, it was your culture. You were Roman. You know what I mean? Like, Paul, for instance, was Jewish, but he was a Roman citizen. He was Roman. See what I mean? Yeah. So it was a little more complicated than that. So there's a few questions that we'd have to ask. Were the Roman si si uh, soldiers from Italy? And if so, did Italy have different kind of lots than the Jews did? Or were, were the Roman citizens from somewhere else? And the third question, were all lots the same, or did each different culture have different kinds of lots? We don't know. Uh, that could have been like a dice, for instance. Like, they were gambling for it, for instance. Or it could have been like casting lots here. We, I don't really know. Uh, that's something worth looking into, but off the top of my head, I have no idea. And so his idea here is that um, although people do, do things, God ultimately will establish things. So once again, don't read too far into it. The idea, the basic idea, once again, I'm way oversimplifying here, but the basic idea is that God is in control of things. Even though things happen that God doesn't want to happen, like Hitler killing a bunch of Jews, even though bad things happen to good people, even though thing, Satan does things, even though... All the, yes, absolutely. However, God is still in control. Yeah, and it's really that simple. So, um, uh, okay. That question was supposed to be for tonight, but we're a little late. So I'll just kind of answer it ourselves, and if you have any questions, you just ask me, okay? Um, all, are all men equal? And this is kind of a weighted question. And it's something that Proverbs actually looks at quite in depth. And the answer is yes and no. All people are equally people, and all people have equal worth, right? But not all people are equal. Let me give you a specific example. Should everybody be given access to free college? Well, let's think about that. Judging on Proverbs, on what Proverbs has taught us. Some men have greater ability, for instance. A foolish person or a wise person, right? A foolish person, you give him money, he's going to squander it. A wise person, you give him money, he's going to invest it. So a wise person sending give them free college isn't a bad thing, right? But you give a full free college, and I'll probably just give up or, or get a degree in something worthless. Right. You know what I mean? So there's that. But then there's also this. Not all men are capable of the same feats. Martin Luther, when he started the Reformation by nailing the th his thesis onto the door, it has been said by many historians that there was nothing special about Martin Luther. It was just the timing was right. But then there are some people who have so far surpassed what was possible at their time. We see this oftentimes with the kings of Persia. Did you know that Persia created the first Pony Express? That they were able to quickly get mail from one end of the empire to the other? Did you know that Rome had um, had cities that were well mapped out with, 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 with streets that were... Why didn't they do that back in the Stone Age? Not all men are capable of the same feats. Napoleon Bonaparte was able to do things that a lot of other people were completely incapable of doing. Yeah. Hitler was able to, to start taking over a lot of areas before they even went to war. And then once they went to war, he would have probably won if he hadn't have pissed off Russia. Yeah. See what I mean? He was able to do something mighty. Was everybody able to do that? No. No. See what I mean? So there are some people who, have, who are more... Then you you have some people who are just more more driven. You know what I mean? More driven people. They'll get something done. You give them a job, they'll do that and they'll do something else too since there was too little for them. You give somebody else that same job and you'll be lucky if they even did it. See what I mean? So then there's that. Uh, not all should be given the same chance. 
Because not all people are equal in that regard. Right. See what I mean? So isn't that not fair? No, life is not meant to be fair. Now, I want you to understand what I'm trying to teach you guys here. Life isn't meant to be fair. Life is meant to be unfair, so that in that unfairness, we rise above the situation. If there were no obstacles, there would be nothing to rise above, and there would be no opportunity for greatness. And if there was no opportunity for greatness, there would be no reason for greatness. Chuck has been born without the opportunity of, of walking. And then, as if that wasn't enough, the kidneys went ahead and just bit the bullet too. This was an opportunity for him to do greater things. If we were all born in perfect health, there would be no exceptional people. There would be no Chucks in the world. There would be a world of mediocre people. And if there's nothing to compare ourselves by, we don't drive ourselves, we don't push ourselves, do we? Do we? If there's nobody out there with an inspirational story and we're all just the exact same, and we're all just, everything's mediocre, well, then none of us are going to try. Life wasn't meant to be fair, and I want you to learn that because, so are all men equal? No. You weren't born with the same looks as somebody else. You weren't born with the same in the same job as somebody else. You weren't born in the same race as somebody else, the same country as somebody else. Yeah. See what I mean? But we aren't judged by that. We're judged by what we do with that. So yes, we are not all equal. Yeah, that is true. However, we each should do the best we can to rise to our own greatness. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that kind of make sense? Awesome. The question of the week. How do you know who to take counsel from? How do you know who to take counsel from? A very weighted question. Let me give you a, a tip on getting a good answer. Read Proverbs. <laughs> if you don't read Proverbs throughout the week, you're not going to get a good answer for this, guys. <laughs> read Proverbs. <laughs> How do you know who to take counsel from? Any questions or comments about the lesson? The tongue is not a root of all of It's not? No. It doesn't say that? But it's not even next week. <clears throat> Does it say anything close to it? Um, it says the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. It does say that, uh -huh. but it doesn't say that it's the root of evil. <laughs> so, uh, Diana, uh, Chuck looked it up, and evidently the, the Bible says all kinds of things about the tongue, but it never says that it's the root of evil. Oh. It says that it's set on fire by hell, that it destroys things, that it's, all of bad things heart, happen. Oh, the heart. It says, uh, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Uh, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire, the you entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. You know what she's thinking of is that verse in Jeremiah where it talks about the heart um, and how it's... Uh, uh, wicked. And wicked, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, look, look that verse up. Uh, I think that's the verse you're talking about, Diana. Um, where, where in Jeremiah it talks about the heart that um, that is deceitful. It's um, uh, what, What's the word? Um it gets you off course. Fully wicked above all things. There you go. And then it says in, in Timothy about uh, the the love of money being a There's something that says it's the root of all evil. What is it? The love of money. The love of money. It says it's a, a, oh, a root. Oh. And now it doesn't say the root. It says okay. a root of all sorts of evil. Okay. So, um, but the question of the, of the week is how do you know who to take counsel from? So any other questions or comments? Me, of course. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were saying you had a question or comment. I got you. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead. Going off of something that you said earlier, um, hurt people do hurt people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do they want to... They don't want to be alone in their own hurt. Well, not necessarily. It's usually... It's, I've found that it's usually not conscious. It's usually something that you lash out when you've been hurt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, um, Th think of a wild animal that you that you put into a corner and they just th get scared wild. and they start they lash out because they're scared and they want to escape. Sorry. It's kind of that way with people. Yeah. So, any other questions or comments?